I see young, old, black, white, students, faculty, staff, and members of the community. I know some of you traveled a long way to be here, and I thank you so much for turning out to hear the story of Anthony Crawford. I also want to thank our other sponsors, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Pan-African Studies, and the Strom Thurmond Institute. There are several in individuals that I'd like to name. Starlet Craig from the Charles Houston Center for the Black Experience in Education. Thank you so much for your help with this event. Cheryl DeSellier and Sandra Parker from Creative Services. They're the ones that are responsible for designing the beautiful poster that you've all seen. And we do have some extra posters, so um, they're in the, in the lobby on a table, and please feel free to take one on your way out tonight. Last but not least, I want to thank Leslie Doss um, from the, the Chief Diversity <laughs> Office. I could have never done this without her, so thank you so much, Leslie. Now I'd like to introduce Ms. Johnson. Doria D. Johnson is a PhD candidate in U.S. History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's a sought-after speaker who has traveled across the country and Europe as a guest lecturer, setting the record straight and telling the story of her great-great-grandfather, Mr. Anthony Crawford. We're very lucky to have her tonight, and I hope that you'll all join me in welcoming Ms. Johnson. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming, Cousin Philip, Cousin Daryl. I have a cousin here tonight that I've never met before, and it's because of this lynching. When I want to talk about um, what happened, right? What brought me to this point? But I can't tell that story. And so uh, about nine years ago, I did an interview with Gwen Ipo with PBS. So I'm going to show that video. It's about eight minutes long, and it tells the story of Grandpa Crawford and sort of how we got involved um, in terms of publicizing it and finally getting to the uh, apology in 2005 from the United States Senate. Um, and then we'll be right back, so thank you. You are about to witness disturbing images that depict lynchings throughout the United States. While I am offering you the opportunity to dismiss yourself from this space, I ask you to stay and witness with me an ugly part of United States history. Some of us call them postcards. Some of us call them unsolved murders and crime scene photos. The music is entitled Strange Fruit by jazz great Billie Holiday. <coughs> Strange Fruit began as a poem written by Abel Miracle. And he was a Jewish high school teacher who taught in the Bronx. And he wrote the poem about the lynching of two black men. He published under the pen name Lewis Allen, worked with the Communist Party. Um, so anyone who challenged the ethos of American exceptionalism, imperialism, racism, and many other oppressive policies and traditions, uh, he worked along with them. The Miracles adopted Robert and Michael, sons of Julius and Ethel Rothenberg, who were convicted of espionage. Now, they were the only couple or the only people in the United States still to this day who were accused of passing information uh, to the Soviet Union about the atomic bomb. And uh, they were the only civilians really executed. Columbia Records refused to distribute and record the song, fearing backlash from its southern customers and radio affiliates. Once Billie Holiday found someone, a record company, an independent record company, to record the song, it became her best-selling record. Time Magazine recently dubbed it Song of the Century. Postcards 
that went through the United States mail. They're also in a traveling exhibit called Without Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America. Historian Leah Litwack calls these postcards the pornography of race relations. The postcards were gathered by <coughs> antique collectors, Jimmy Allen and John Littlefield. And Jimmy said he was out one day picking. And picking means to buy something from people who don't want it anymore and selling it to some folks who do. He said that one day while he was out picking, he found out that also for sale was a national shame. I typically will start this lecture by dedicating my time here to those who were lynched on this day in history. And remember that these are documented lynchings, right? And we know that there are two to three times as many more. One unidentified black man was lynched in Hedgeville, Texas in 1890. Edward William was lynched in Deep Creek, Mississippi in 1900 picked off two or three times per week. I thought long and hard about coming here. I vowed to never speak in the belly of the beast, in the putrid spirit, in the place that caused my family so much pain, where 400 people can boldly murder without punitiveness or shame. And now I have to confront the descendants of that history. <clears throat> this may be the toughest talk I've ever given, but it also is probably the most important because I'm within virtual earshot of my ancestors. I am the great, 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 great granddaughter of a proud African man who lost his name to me during the transatlantic slave trade or the Middle Passage, but I came to know him as Charles Crawford and his wife, Lydia. I am the great, great, great granddaughter of their son, Thomas Crawford, and his wife, Amanda Martin. I am the great, great granddaughter of their son, Anthony Crawford, and his wife, Phoebe Williams. I am the great granddaughter of their son, George Crawford, and his wife, Annabelle Washington. I am the granddaughter of their daughter, Fanny Crawford Brooks and her husband, Joseph Brooks, and I am the daughter of Helen Brooks Johnson and her husband, Charles Johnson. And half the folks I just named are buried here. May the ancestors be forever pleased with my actions, and I hope they bless my words. If you don't mind, I'm going to take my time today and unpack the cultural production of you. And in some ways begin our healing mine and yours. Because if you have your foot on someone's neck, neither of us can move. And this is not my history to hold solely. It's the history of South Carolina and America, and white America in particular. But it, the craft of historical inquiry, which I've chosen as a career, um, and requires an examination of historical data and evidence and research, peer review, writing, and professing. All those activities are therapeutic to us. But it also requires an interesting tightrope walk down one own geological makeup. And sometimes it causes us to trip and fall into piles of piss and blood and gore and shit. In some ways, coming here is a betrayal. Growing up, every one of my friends would spend summers visiting relatives in the South, in places named Abbeville, and Greenwood, and McCormick, <coughs> and Anderson. Not my family. You know, during the Great Migration, sometimes if women got knocked up, they called it, right? or something else happened to them that could potentially embarrass the family in the North, they were sent back south. Not my family. We went to Philadelphia, where half of Grandpa Crawford's kids ran to. My grandpa
Grandpa Crawford's last living son, Uncle Anthony, lived in Eustis, Florida, and he died in 1990. He said he would not spend another nickel in Abigail County. I'll remember that tomorrow as I travel there on the tour bus. I'll try to remember his edict. He was a teenager at the time. They say Grandpa Crawford had two minor children with him the day he was murdered. That the two children were taken into the cellar of a store owned by a Jewish family. There's a documentary filmmaker here, Carol DeVoe, who has interviewed that family, and they were also told the story of the lynching. And very proud of the role that they played that day. So sometimes you can walk that type of road and fall into stories of survival and redemption and camaraderie. They want me to teach them the history of lynching in African American study classes. But that's an assumption I struggle with. It seems to me that African Americans own very little of this history. We were not at lynching for a very long period of time, and almost never until the end. And thus, we need white America to tell us what happened. So the quantification of it seems skewed. The qualification is another story. I'm taught in graduate studies to make a linear connection between things, to compare same for same, to make comparisons that make sense. <coughs> the historical enterprise <coughs> makes that process sometimes complicated. Please stay with me as I try to disentangle this history. Cultural theorist Stuart Hall says that when we ask someone where they're from, one can expect a very long story nowadays. Where am I from? Am I from Africa? Am I from South Carolina? Am I from Illinois? Do I descend from a lynching victim or did I survive a lynching? That mob, that mob had set out to kill us all. I'm lucky to be here. Grandpa paid taxes and the state did not protect him. Nor did it protect my great grandparents, nor my grandmother and really not me. My grandmother was born before the lynching happened and lived on the family compound. Here is my great, great uncle, Walter Crawford. He was the oldest child of Grandpa Crawford. Uncle Walter wrote a letter to the governor of South Carolina and he asked that <coughs> the family have protection against lawlessness because the white community of Evanston, I mean, um, at Abbeville had published um, an order in the newspaper that said that the Crawford family must quit the state of South Carolina by November 15th. So if you can kind of read this letter, you see the tenor and tone of it is very respectful. Um, Uncle Walker talks about how he is an AME minister, he's an educated man, that we own 427 acres of prime cotton land, which is, equates to about one third of this campus. And he asked that it's winter time, that we want to remain in the land of our ancestors, that we're taxpayers and we want to be protected. Governor Manning wrote back and he said, well, I do deplore this lynching. I cannot guarantee your safety. What does it mean to have the governor write you back and say that? You don't understand the pain you caused my family, South Carolina. <coughs> I was at a friend's house recently, Anna Roosevelt. She's the great-great-granddaughter of Teddy Roosevelt, President of the United States from 1901 through 1909. She's also the great-niece of Eleanor Roosevelt, FDR's wife. We walked around her home and she showed me portraits of her ancestors, the President, an original with paint chipping off of it, and she casually mentioned that she'd have to get it repaired someday. She had paintings and photos of Teddy's relatives, his son, his wife, his mother. 
I too descend from someone important, I thought. Someone accomplished, someone wealthy, a respected leader, but I can't touch his image. I was recently went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and um, Grandpa's photo that you saw earlier is there. Well, the librarians, um, I told them, casually mentioned that I was his great great granddaughter, and the librarians went and got me gloves, and they went down to the, um, the stacks to get the photo. And when they came back to deliver the photograph, 10 other librarians were there, and they were just sort of watching me um, look at the photo. And I asked me how I felt, and I said, well, you know, uh, I feel like I kind of want to be alone. And then the second thing I felt is, how the hell did you get it? I mean, I don't know how they got the photograph. <laughs> they just have no clue. Um, but those, so those sort of things, those, those sort of subtle things in history, then Anna's house is full <coughs> of her memories of her ancestors, but we don't have anything that belongs to Grandpa Crawford. I remember that one of my cousins told me that he once took his seed down to his river, Penny Creek, and threw all, all the seeds in it and said, I'd rather throw it away than have them take it. Anna described what it was like to go to her family compound, both in Oyster Bay, New York, and Warm Springs, Georgia. And she casually mentioned these places and um, so if you remember, I talked about sort of the problems with comparative histories and research. And I'm not trying to compare my life with her, certainly, except to say that our families have expectations for us. We both come from men who were leaders, had access to wealth, who believed their families should enjoy it. Grandpa Crawford probably imagined a world where I could escape the danger he endured. He worked very hard, he was powerful, and perhaps a bit of an autocrat. There are reports of him being somewhat elitist and entitled, but I could not imagine the world he lived in where he embodied the counter narrative of America. Shortly after slavery ended, many African Americans lived in two parent married with children <coughs> home environments. In fact, most did. It's not a story that we often hear. An institution mostly denied to us marriage and family. It's something we embraced. Americans were given the right to vote. Black codes were enforced. This systematically took it away. Now, in the 60s, when the Voting Rights Act were passed, President Nixon in 1971 declared a war on drugs. And it shepherded many men of color into prison so that now we have the largest prison, prison system known in the history of mankind, thus removing them systematically from their families for seemingly minor offenses. Even a drug issue has been considered a health issue since the 1920s. But as demonstrated during both enslavement and reconstruction, again, we've always desired families and education. So much so that most academics will credit blacks with having invented the public school system. And in terms of families, we certainly invented the model for blended families. We also have fictive families. Everybody is our cousins. You know, the, the, the kids of your mother's best friend are considered your cousins. In 67, many Southern courts assumed that African American parents were unfit to care for their children and under the system of black holes ordered the removal of black children and white families, sometimes their former owners. They were to remain in apprenticeship systems. This smacked of re-enslavement to African Americans who stepped up and, and created families for these kids. So in 1877, during Reconstruction, I have to set up for you the conditions that set up this lynching here in Abbeville. The federal troops were brought in. And that's because the South Carolina African Americans were very successful. So even in the midst of all this success, the accusations thrown around the media said that 
African Americans were down in <coughs> Mississippi and South Carolina drinking while they were in the legislature, stealing, and, the every, and that's far from the truth. In fact, during Reconstruction, South Carolina produced more cotton than it did before the Civil War. And that's because African American men were in charge of finances for the state and had thought about what it would look like to finance and support farmers. So you see this quote here by Lerone Bennett says, instead of crumbling under black power, the state as a whole prospered. In fact, South Carolina produced a larger portion of America's cotton. I thought about today how ironic it is that I'm standing in a strong Thurman Institute, right? <laughs> I think everyone associated with getting this talk together had heard that comment. And as I walked around campus, I kept thinking about that in the history of John C. Calhoun. Um, John C. Calhoun is really credited sometimes with the whole idea of the Civil War, right? And uh, we were walking around campus yesterday and I was reading signs about the history of Clemson and saw almost nothing that referred to this being a plantation. This was a large plantation. Fort Hill is called Fort Hill, but I, it, there's no, almost no reference to that being, you know, a plantation with um, John C. Calhoun's enslaved people living all around him. And all that sort of erased from the the history here on campus. So, um, Susan Clemson was one of his enslaved people. But, so this is a picture from 1880. It's not during, uh, since before um, the Civil War. But I just thought it was an interesting picture that the university uses on their website. So, Standing in the strong Thurman Institute, I keep thinking is, did he build this space for this, right? Or am I pro providing a common narrative to him and using this space in a rival way? Now I talked about South Carolina being a space for public education. And Grandpa had a school for the black children of Abbeville on his property, certainly. It was registered with the state. But also, Abbeville is known to be home of Harbison College, um, which my great-grandmother went to um, before, of course, lynching. And then she moved to Chicago, Illinois, and had to scrub toilets. It's an educated woman. This was the story of a lot of people who it, um, joined the Great Migration we know now that lynching and racialized violence is very central to the Great Migration. Some southern counties had no out-migration and some had total, and the difference is a large lynching. So Harbison College was funded by the United Presbyterian Church. It opened in 1885 in Abbeville uh, with 66 students. Um, by 1901, they were growing so much that they had to to um, purchase more acreage and actually moved on the outskirts of town. So we see by 1903, there are 334 students and seven faculty. Now, for those of us who have a 2 2 or a 2 3 um, teaching assignment, could you imagine what it's been like to teach with that many students and seven faculty? We've come a long way. From 1893 through 1910, there are a lot of documentation with a lot of skirmishes with the white community in Abbeville. So usually what that means is something is going right. So it's time to dismantle the institution. There were three significant fires at Harvestman. So in 1907, many people pulled their children or their offspring out of Harvestman because of the dorm prior in the women's dorm. In 1908, they record 2,700 people have graduated to date. So they're very active. 224 students, 1,200 books in the library. But 
But in 1910, something horrible happened. Kerosene is used to light the school on fire, and three students died. Many more were injured. The Presbyterian Church at that time decides we have to move this place out of here. So they moved it 70 miles away. The school was still open until 1958. What did it mean for African Americans to own property? The ex slaves of the South were said to be free, but being landless, their freedom was of little consequence. People equate freedom with land ownership. So the NAACP, who most people thought of as a civil rights organization, did nothing almost for its first 30 years but investigate lynching. They came to Abbeville to investigate grandpa. Lynching is a very famous article, and I think most of us who handled this article when we were children, right? Cousin? Yeah. Just briefly, I want to document uh, or tell you about the way that we use lynching, uh, the way I'm using it today is the mob violence for perceived crime. And it's really a controlling behavior. But for those of us who descend from a lynching, it weaves the very fabric of our lives. Senator Mary Landrieu calls lynching domestic terrorism. <clears throat> so some victims were Jewish, some were women, some were children, most were black, most were in the South, but some were in Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin. Some were for perceived crime, right? But most were for people who were politically active, um, advancing economically, <coughs> and sometimes accused of association with white women, or for acting white, acting uppity. The Negro now, by eternal grace, must learn to stay in the Negro's place. 1908 lynching postcard. As we can see in the case of Grandpa Crawford, nothing he did was good enough for the dominant culture. The unraveling of slavery did not guarantee the newly free and their offspring would stay in their prescribed spaces, and so lynching was a form of terrorism used, behavior modification. Death was now a constant threat for enslaved if they did not perform or conform to Southern culture. This postcard reads, this is the barbecue we had last night. My picture's on the left with a cross over it. Your son, Joe. In the pictures you saw earlier, there were men, women, children, government officials in the crowd. Grandpa Crawford was lynched on a Saturday afternoon, and I often wonder how many people went home and washed their hands and went to church Sunday morning. That crowd was getting good, royalistic, visual training in race relations, backed by science, undergirded by politics, supported by culture and tradition, enhanced with alcoholic beverages and snacks, and enforced by murder. The members of the crowd and mobs were not viewed as degenerates, they were not viewed as perverted, they were not viewed as immoral, they were not mentally ill, nor were they ostracized for their attendance. They were normal. They were educated, they were cultured, and they were erudite. Now, the popular literature today said that black people had uh, propensity to uh, criminal behavior, that they were buffoons, rapists, and if you look at Nora, Nora Nelson's face, she looks like me, just like me and my mother. So what role does everyone play here? What other photographer? Are we to assume the positioning in the bodies were in the right space to take a photo? Or did they have to turn on lighting? I'm told that photographers would ask people to drive their cars around to light up the body so that they could get a good shot. The bottom photograph here, public utility lighting was used to assist the mob in its endeavor. Whose job is it to grant an access? 
lighting on public thoroughfares? Are you municipalities somewhat responsible too? Is a photographer more culpable because they sometimes included their byline, signature, logo, or name? So by doing so, they anticipated a future enterprise, right? What are the crowds who circle the bodies to gaze at their success? How culpable are they for posing for the picture, often pointing a finger at the corpse? African Americans responded to lynchings in various ways. The black press covered lynching extensively advocated and lobbied for federal anti-lynching legislation. The individual states could not be trusted to prosecute the murder of black people. Here, as in many times in the history of this country, college students took up the charge to demonstrate. So this is at Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1935. And as you can see, these students have nooses on their necks. Ida B. Wells was a journalist who lost three of her best friends, business owners who competed with whites very early in life. She made it her mission to expose the atrocity of lynching and to rebuke the notion that African Americans were somehow deserving of mob violence. Southern whites, she discovered, used the excuse of rape as a veil for their true reason for lynching, black people's economic and political progress. She also challenged, very publicly, white women to speak out against their sons, their husbands, their fathers, their uncles, and their pastors, and others who participated in lynchings and who mistakenly reinforced the primitive identity of black men as criminals and rapists. This postcard reads, the answer of the Anglo-Saxon race to black brutes who would attack the womanhood of the South. Ida B. Wells once remarked, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. I had already determined to sell my life as dearly as possible if attacked. I felt if I could take one lyncher with me, it would even up the score a little bit. The last thing Grandpa Crawford said in public was to the doctor who came to attend to his wounds in the jail. He removed his bank book from his pocket, and he said, give my bank book to my children, and I thought I was a good citizen. But Grandpa knew the atmosphere he lived in, and I think he knew he wouldn't die a natural death, because according to the NAACP, he said, the day a white man hits me is the day I die. Well, he died for a lot less. The family lore has it that the Crawford boys waited in trees with guns that night to protect the rest of us. The Crawford, well, um, Grandpa Crawford's sons and the sons of another family, a white family, had an altercation in Abbeville at the turn of the century. And Grandpa Crawford took out an ad in the paper which said, after all is said and done, after the arrest between my boys and the Nelson boys, I hope the citizens of Abbeville will accept our humble wish for peace. It will be the highest endeavor of our lives to strive to make us good citizens in the future as we have in the past. For individuals as well as nations, sometimes differ. <coughs> but it is meet and right to, to settle our differences legally and amicably. Signed a citizen, Anthony P. Crawford. I sometimes wonder what the climate was in our family compound that night. I imagine that with 13 children, most of them married with their own families, and two minor children, that the mood would have been somber and chaotic. Were they packing? Were they praying? Were they scared? Or were they ready for war? They were not allowed to retrieve Grandpa Crawford's body from the tree for a while. They were told to leave it hanging there for the duration to show other African Americans what would happen to them if they got out of place. We still don't know where Grandpa Crawford is buried. His remains were eventually retrieved by the family. I know because I held the um, bill for the funeral in my hand. However, the family was threatened so much, there was a genuine fear that the grave would be desecrated. And so his body was interred in a secure and secret place on the family compound. 
One cousin described a spot he had just taken to in the 1950s and said that the grave was covered with little white pebbles that signals an African burial. Grandpa Crawford lived in the home in 1880 with his grandfather, Charles Crawford, who was born in Africa in 1780. I wonder what kind of stories did I miss knowing that his grandfather came from Africa. We recently did DNA tests and we know that we're from both Angola and Nigeria, as much as the DNA test can tell us. Um, but I do know that African Americans from Angola um, have a tendency to have sickle cell and sickle cell is prominent in our family. So, Again, when the governor wrote back to Uncle Walter and said, I can't protect your family, my great-grandfather wrapped up my great, my grandmother in newspaper when I understand to protect them from the cold. And made the trek to Evanston, Illinois, November 11, 1916. Grandpa George never set foot back in South Carolina again. So that will end the formal portion of my lecture, and I'm going to challenge, push back, make elastic or otherwise comment on what I said here today. Thank you.